Our fourth reading today is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, verses 28 to 37. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware and keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, at cockcrow, or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. And may God speak to us through these verses today. A writer named Samuel Beckett once wrote a very famous play called Waiting for Godot. It's basically about two men standing on a deserted road waiting for someone named Godot to arrive. Now, as they wait, they talk, they argue, talk about the past, strangers wander by and then move on. But through the whole time, they keep wondering when or even if Godot will show up. They wonder, are they in the right place? Is it the right day? Again and again, they complain. They're fed up. How much longer do we have to wait? So they decide to leave. But finally, before they do, a messenger arrives and says, Godot could not make it today. Maybe he'll come tomorrow. So they wait. The next day, pretty much the exact same things happen. Same conversations, same strangers come and go. But they are growing more and more angry and upset. And at the end of the day, the messenger comes again to say, Godot couldn't make it today, maybe tomorrow. Once more, the two men decide to leave. They keep standing there as the stage goes dark and the curtain comes down. Now, some have interpreted this play as the story of humanity waiting for God. A God who has promised to come, but seems to keep delaying, keep us waiting. And sometimes while we wait, we lose hope. Now, our earlier reading from the prophet Isaiah seems to echo some of these same fears. Isaiah says, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake and the nations would tremble at your presence. This is a cry. It is a cry of anguish. It is a lament. Isaiah is begging God for a sign, a sign that God is still with Isaiah and his people. Because to them it seems that God is hiding. Things are bad. Israel has been conquered and taken into captivity by their worst enemy, Babylon. How could such a disaster happen? How long would go on? When will you show yourself, God, and do something? Isaiah wants God to put everything right. Don't forsake us, he says. Remember, we are your people. In the meantime, they wait, and they wait for God. Now, I'm sure to some degree or another, we have all kind of been in that frame of mind, that emotional state. When things happen in our lives that make us wonder, is God hiding? Has God turned away from us? Those times when we look at what's going on out in the world and we ask, when will God come down out of the sky and do something about all this? And we wait, and we wait. A reading from Mark's gospel is also about waiting. Like Isaiah, Jesus' disciples have been asking, when will God appear to change everything? When will the kingdom come? 
Jesus says the answer is that no one knows. He tells them not to waste their time worrying about it. Don't worry about the when or the where or the how it will happen. Instead, he says, just worry about doing what God wants you to do. And in the meanwhile, watch for signs of God's appearance because you never know when God will show up. Now, of course, as Christians, we have somewhat of a different perspective than Isaiah. And we even have a different perspective from some of those first disciples who, let's face it, didn't always fully understand Jesus. Now, let's start on something very basic. We don't believe God is hiding on the other side of the sky, do we? In ancient times, the common belief was that the earth was flat and the sky was a solid dome or shell over it with us human beings on the inside and God out there on the outside. We know the sky is not solid, it's just air. Beyond the air is outer space. There is no shell for God to break through. Another thing, we do believe that in Jesus Christ, God has been revealed to us in a new way. Jesus promises us that God is not distant, God is not frightening, but God is actually living and active among us in this world. God does not forget us or forsake us. God does not turn away from us in anger. Instead, God is always turning to us with love, with forgiveness, offering us peace and hope to bring us new life and a new future. Now, the people who actually walked with Jesus were able to experience God this way through him. And even after his death, we can still experience God that way through him. Jesus the man may have died, but Jesus the Christ, the manifestation of God in him, could not die. The disciples really didn't get this. They didn't fully grasp it until maybe after his death. And even then, they still didn't completely understand. And neither did many of the Christians who came after them and kept trying to figure it out. Now, let me be honest, my friends. Even today, we still don't have it completely figured out. You know, we speak of all these elements of our faith <clears throat> with words and images like incarnation, resurrection, second coming. But deep down, these remain mysteries. And however we interpret these images, they do express our fundamental belief that the living and eternal Christ has never really left us. He is still and always among us, even if it may not always seem that way. And we believe that somehow God is bringing in a new future through this Christ. Our scriptures tell us that God's purpose is for all of creation to be like Christ. And if that is the plan, if that is the goal, we continue to wait for that future. But from our reading in Mark's gospel, I think we can assume that there are two different kinds of waiting. Now remember those two men in Samuel Beckett's play. They staked out a spot on a deserted road and they just stood there, doing nothing, going nowhere. They weren't even sure if it was the right place or time, but they refused to leave that spot for fear of missing Godot. And their only concern seemed to be what Godot could do for them. That's one kind of waiting. And frankly, it's not really a very good one. It's full of misunderstandings and frustration. And at the end of that play, we are left with the impression that those two men will keep on waiting there forever, neither one of them any wiser or with any hope in sight. The other kind of waiting is the kind that Jesus talks about. Not just standing around by ourselves, staring up at the sky and expecting it to open up, but rather paying attention to what's going on around us, looking for signs of God's active presence among us, 
doing the will of God, doing God's work in this world. Because doesn't it make sense that if God's purpose is for the whole world to be like Christ, then the more we become like Christ, and the more Christ-like we help the world to become, then the quicker God can accomplish that purpose and bring that glorious future closer. And not just for some of us, but for all of us. Allow me to tell you the story of another play written by a man named Edwin Markham. It's about a shoemaker who has a dream in which Jesus promises to visit him and his wife on Christmas Eve. The shoemaker and his wife believe this dream with all their hearts, and they get very excited. So they prepare for this big event. They fix up the house. They cook this huge, wonderful dinner, and then they wait. But soon, there's a knock at the door, but it turns out just to be some poor beggar in ratty clothes. Well, it is Christmas, so the couple invite the beggar in. They give him some of their food they made to eat. The shoemaker even makes him a new pair of shoes. Then after he's gone, the couple sit and wait for Jesus again. Shortly, an elderly woman arrives. She tells the couple she was evicted from her home, and she's been wandering around in the cold looking for her son's house, but she got lost. They give her some of their big dinner that they prepared. And then the shoemaker goes out to help her find her son's house. On his way home, the shoemaker comes across a small boy who's trying to find some place to buy bread to eat. But all the shops are closed for Christmas. So the shoemaker brings him home. He learns that the boy's father recently passed away and he's living with his poor widowed mother. So they give the boy some of their food, and they send him home. And it's getting late, and as the night passes, as Christmas Eve is nearly over, as most of their wonderful dinner is gone, the couple find themselves wondering why Jesus never showed up. All those other folks showed up, but not Jesus, and Jesus had promised them. They were so sure Jesus would come. And the answer, of course, is that Jesus did come, just not in the way they expected. Jesus was there in the loving kindness that those people shared with others. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus once said, I am there. And he said, whenever you do kind, merciful things to the least of these, you do them to me. And maybe that Maybe that is how and where we should be looking for Jesus to appear. Not coming down out of the sky, but appearing here among us in the words and deeds of love that we share with each other, especially with those who need them most. The people who get the least of everything and who are treated as the least valuable. As I said Last week and other times, love is what God's future is made of, and love is how we help bring that future into being. Well, my friends, today is the first Sunday of Advent, our season of preparation for Christmas. And we have the decorations up and the lights up. And it's very beautiful, and it's a very special time for so many of us, a time of nostalgia, a time of warmth. But Advent is not about preparing the decorations for our homes or even for our churches. Advent is about preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ into the world. Not just once 2,000 years ago, not just on one holiday of the year. We are reminded to prepare our hearts and our lives for Christ to come to us today and tomorrow, and all the rest of our tomorrows. Advent reminds us we are not stuck in the past. We are not trapped by whatever sorrows or mistakes or circumstances may be holding us back. But instead, a new day is always dawning. 
Each day is a new opportunity to focus our attention by watching for signs of Christ's coming and volunteering to be part of his coming. As we wait for the future, God holds out to us as both a hope and a promise, a future that can be ours if we are willing to take hold of it and make it the future we want. Amen. <laughs>